was the first speaker, Dr. Ejava, to talk. He has never been known to him. He is a great teacher and also academically oriented person. And he will talk on how to prevent anemia in neonates and uh, infants. We have a large number of uh, preterm and uh, low birth weight. It is not only an issue of uh, preterm low birth weight, we have problem with term babies also, developing anemia. So I request uh, Dr. Pejavar, please uh, start your lecture. And I request all the speakers to stick to time so that we will be able to finish at least one hour behind schedule. Good evening. Am I audible and visible? Yes, 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 sir. Good evening to one and all. It is a pleasure to be here at the Neonatology CME of the Tamil Nadu IAP State Chapter. Nice to see all my friends from Pondicherry and Tamil Nadu. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tirumurugan and the team to give me an opportunity here. I still remember, I think uh, we came across for the first time when there was a massive uh, first TOT held in Bangalore in yes, 2009, yes, you and Prakash Shamboy Ram, I, if I remember right. Yes, sir, you're they, right, sir. You're right, sir. I think you remember Anyway, right. that's all history now. Uh, I have, uh, uh, I, I realize that we are about an hour behind schedule and I'll stick to my 20 minutes and try and not uh, overstep the limit. Now, prevention of anemia in newborns and infants. I will not be covering. This is a change from all the previous speakers. Instead of saying what I will be covering, I'm saying I will not be covering any specific things like thalassemia, all those hemolytic anemias and all. Instead, I'm going to discuss anemia as an endemic problem of our country, looking at the picture, bigger picture, taking the perinatal approach route and trying to put a stop to the chronicity or the continuing saga of anemia from the intrauterine life straight on to even infancy and childhood. It may involve some policy matters also. Anemia in children is a huge problem around the globe. In India, it's a major cause of morbidity. Studies that have been done a decade apart have shown that there has not been much improvement regarding anemia in infants and children, including newborns. The study done in 2005 and 6 revealed a 69.5% prevalence of anemia of some degree. And the study done in 2016-17 reveals about 59%. So there has been only a 10% decrease in the last decade. Now of this 58.5%, about two to 4% are severe anemias and about 30% is moderate and nearly about 27% are mild. So it is very clear that anemia is endemic in our country. A recent international study done, which looked at about over one lakh children showed that anemia is present across the strata of the society. Nearly more than 50% of the anemia is there among the richer strata and two thirds of the poorer strata also suffer from anemia of some degree. The point here is, especially the iron deficiency anemia as we all know, causes severe cognitive and intellectual deficiencies. Various pathophysiologies have been described, defects in the neurotransmitter function and defects in myelination are some of the important ones. In the end of the day, anemia in newborn and infants will interfere with the general well-being of the baby. It will continue and it will interfere with growth and development and with the associated other nutrition deficiencies will cause stunting too. So it's a very serious problem. And there are about a dozen major organizations, if you know, have started their campaign a year ago, eradicate anemia. It starts from National Neonatology Forum to FIGO to uh, UNICEF, various organizations. Now, what are the things we should keep in mind? 
as neonatologists, we should think a little bit before and after our times also, not just the neonatal period. Now, throughout pregnancy, we know that iron deficiency anemia adversely affects maternal and fetal well-being. And it is definitely linked to increased morbidity and even fetal death. Adverse perinatal outcomes include intrauterine growth restriction, prematurity, and low birth weight. It is said that iron deficiency during the first trimester has more negative impact on fetal growth than anemia developing later pregnancy. So what I'm trying to say is the antenatal visits are not done properly, even before you realize the iron deficiency would have done its harm to the growing fetus. Iron deficiency anemia is also a true risk for preterm labor. So prevention and research studies have shown that prevention of anemia in a mother gets better result than treatment of anemia during the first or second trimester. So the we have to think of maternal anemia, uh, maternal anemia. This is where we have to liaise with our obstetricians. Let me tell you something. Without a team approach as a perinatal team, many of the problems in newborns and infants cannot be tackled. Of course, the ideal would be a life cycle approach from adolescence to preconception, antenatal treatment of the lady. But well, it is easier said than done. But in all things, health education is the most important one. Health education regarding the awareness of preventing anemia, health education regarding the prompt antenatal visits, provision of health education when they come to the antenatal visit regarding the diet and the iron supplementation, et cetera, et cetera. So health, health education is the mantra which is really required to tackle many of our perinatal neonatal and maternal problems. One of the intervention which I want to again emphasize is the timing of the cord clamping. Now, active management of third stage involved in giving uterotonic medication, clamping and cutting the cord immediately and delivering the placenta. We were worried about postpartum hemorrhage, rightly so. But later on, we realized that delaying the clamping of the cord would allow some more blood to pass on to the newborn and legitimately that blood belongs to the newborn, please remember. So the concept of delayed cord clamping started. Now, a lot of people use the word term deferred cord clamping because the word delay means probably we have made a mistake. So the abbreviation remains the same DCC, but it's called deferred cord clamping. ECC is early cord clamping. If you see the initial studies regarding these things, there was no uniformity. Early cord clamping could be five to 10 seconds and delayed cord clamping could be 30 seconds, 45 seconds, one minute, two minutes, three minutes. But however, now it is agreed upon that a minimum of one minute of deferring cord clamping has its own benefit. I will not go into the details of this because I know that most of you know this, but the point is practicing it. Please remember I was looking at the audit studies and the QI studies of timing of cord clamping. Even today, most of the QI studies, when they start the, the, the uh, practice is involving only 30 to 40% babies, goes up to 70% with your Pokey studies and PDSA cycles, but we don't know how long this 70 to 75% is maintained. So what I'm trying to say is just because we in major institutions or major hospitals practice deferred cord clamping, that doesn't mean it is uniformly practiced or it has the compliance rate which is expected of it. So we have to remember this. We have to cooperate with our obstetric colleagues and make sure for the betterment of the newborn and the betterment of the neonatologist's life, they have to practice delayed cord clamping. Benefits are plenty. Decrease in neonatal and infant anemia is a definite advantage. And in a country, low income country like ours, this is the most cost effective way of making sure the newborns have good hemoglobin, good hemocrit, hematocrit, and it takes them safely till that danger period 
of hemoglobin falling to its nadir or iron deficiency anemia creeping in. If that part, if we take care, then with the dietary and other iron supplementations, we can definitely avoid this major national problem. The skeptic, skepticals think about polycythemia and increased levels of neonatal jaundice. I've given you the studies here. Please remember, these are all not statistically significant. Sarnadius et al. looking at more than 250 babies has shown that cord clamping at 15 seconds, one minute and three minutes group has increased the hematocrit by 53 to 53.5%, 57 and 59 difference is significant even after 24 to 48 hours. The next group of investigators have shown that the advantages last even until two to six months and during the second half of the first year. Now, more iron is transferred to the baby, nearly 50 milligrams per kg of iron and increase of PCV is seen with the additional blood volume of 20 ml. And now we all know that most of the blood which flows into the baby from the cord happens in the first minute and one minute of deferred cord clamping is sufficient. Polycythemia, even two to 5% of term newborns have polycythemia. Risk of developing it due to, due to C DCC is not statistically significant and none of them have required any symptomatic treatment uh, with symptoms needing treatment. Hyperbilirubinemia is a very mild uh, uh, problem, but even then studies have been conducted and there is no increased risk of hyperbilirubinemia, which is statistically significant or requiring any major form of treatment. Some people may say by delaying, we are increasing the maternal hemorrhage. McDonald and Middleton in their Cochrane review have very clearly shown that there is no significant difference between ECC and DCC with regard to mean maternal blood loss, maternal hemoglobin values, maternal need for transfusion, need for manual removal of placenta because of any delay, or a third stage of labor lasting very long, or therapeutic extra administration of uterotronics. So all the ill effects of DCC are now uh, removed from our minds. But still we have a problem if a baby needs resuscitation. It has been very clearly shown, our own Dr. Amit Upadhyaya, one of his early studies, RCT has shown that umbilical cord milking, if done properly, increases the initial HB and does everything that a delayed cord clamping would achieve. There are videos available in the internet how to do it systematically without causing any major problem. So it's a safe intervention. And whenever possible, it has to be practiced. There's only one major long-term study of seven-month developmental outcomes. DCC at birth, protective of very low birth weight male infant against motor disability at seven months of corrected age. Probably the mechanisms are reduced occurrence of IVH, reduced late onset of sepsis. And DCC may have improved the blood flow to the brain better oxygenation at delivery. So now the studies have been performed even in preterm babies, and it has been found that it is a cost-effective major intervention to prevent, prevent anemia and help the baby pass on from newborn period to infancy and infancy to childhood. Almost all the professional bodies are now, are recommending, now recommending a minimum of one minute delay. When there is severe recitation is required, as I said, milking is fine. Now the question comes, even otherwise, can routine care be given by the mother's side? Yes. Anyway, our recommendation now is to deliver the baby on the mother's abdomen. Routine care takes only about a minute and initial steps can be very easily done by the side of the mother. Our biomedical engineering friends are more smarter than us and they have beaten us to it. And there are now very nice trolleys which are available, which can be taken close to the mother's bedside and the needful can be done. Now, the second point I want to mention is the iatrogenic blood loss in preterm infants. I will only quote one study 
councilmen at all. They looked at 24 babies, less than 28 weeks of gestation. The medium, median cumulative iatrogenic loss was per 24, uh, 24 mils per kg in the first two weeks of life. The, it equals to a median of 28.5% of the total blood volume of the baby. As, and as we all understand, blood loss was higher in the most extreme preterm infants because the total volume is less and more blood is required for repeated investigations. The median number of punctures per infant was 47, ranging from 26 to 56 during the first three to four weeks of life. And one of the most significant observations here is if they required a transfusion, the total amount of blood transfusion they required before discharge was almost equivalent to the amount of blood which was drawn for investigations, which means that most of the natural blood loss or whatever it is due to hemolysis are taken care of the baby to some extent, but what we remove, we have to put back. So what is the moral of the story? Let us not do investigations unnecessarily. It is easier said than done, and each of us may have a different definition for essential investigation. But all we have to agree is nothing called routine investigation. There's nothing called giving blood transfusion previous day, packed RBC, and doing a hemoglobin next day. See, these things can be avoided. And most important thing is we have to keep an account of the amount of blood withdrawn. Nurses are the best practitioners as far as these things are concerned. Give them the responsibility and they will do it very, very meticulously. One of the important things which have come up recently is restrictive RBC transfusion criteria. So irrespective of the other things, restrictive RBC transfusion criteria itself if followed will reduce the need for packed red cell uh, transfusion. We all know the major problems with blood transfusion, not just infection, not just, uh, uh, you know, graft force uh, reaction, plus also problems like transfusion related gut problems and NACs. So every unit should have a audit periodically about their transfusion practices and the criteria they use for transfusion. The machines which are there in the lab do routine blood. So they are for adults and pediatrics together. So you require more blood. If you have now what you call as benchtop analyzers, which you can have in the room next to your NICU, these are highly accurate bedside point of care monitors. And they use very, very diminishing blood volumes. And there are now provision where after the reading is done, the blood can be returned back to the baby. These are all important things which are coming up to <laughs> prevent unnecessary transfusions. Transcutaneous measurements of bilirubin, uh, hemoglobin are now in use. Research is going on. Instead of blood investigations, can you do some of the things in saliva and urine as an alternative? Non-invasive measurements of analytes, infrared and spectrophotometric methods can be utilized. Newer things are going to come in the next decade using microchip, microarray and nanotechnology, especially for uh, doing blood cultures and things like that. Artificial intelligence, computer will look at 10,000 jaundice in the conjunctiva and will tell you with fair accuracy, just with a photograph, what could be the jaundice. The mother's hemoglobin looking at the conjunctiva can be now estimated very closely using artificial intelligence. Just a slide on recombinant human erythropoietin. This has not taken up anywhere, especially in India. There are studies here and there we see. Initially, it was quite an expensive uh, medication, but now we know that the prices have come down because of the lot of usage in dialysis. But this study shows that by the end of the fourth week of therapy, there was significant increase in the group one that who were given the EPO compared to group two regarding reticulocyte counts and 
that leading to the rise in the hemoglobin and hematocrit with subsequent reduction in overall number of blood transfusions. I don't know how many in the people who are listening now are using erythropoietin. I do not have much experience in the use of erythropoietin anyway. But however, erythropoietin along with uh, vitamin E, folic acid, stimulated erythropoiesis and significantly reduced the need for blood transfusion in anemia of prematurity. So anemia of prematurity is one thing we may find a, a application for this, but not otherwise. I would be making a mistake if I do not encourage exclusive breastfeeding and early initiation of breastfeeding as a preventive aspect of iron deficiency anemia. The iron content may not be great, but the bioavailability is fantastic. When breastfeeding goes, we have to keep a close eye on the mother's diet of the lactating mother. So that is very important. And of course, later on, the pediatricians will look at the introduce, in, introduction of complementary feeds at the appropriate six months of age and still continue the breastfeeding. So to summarize, the preventive aspect, see the anemia starts from the mother to the intrauterine life to the fetus and continues in the neonate and infant. And in this very sensitive period leads to the damage to cognitive function and the brain growth. So it is very important that we tackle it, tackle it as early as possible. To summarize what I have said, maternal diet and iron supplementation, diet of lactating mothers, iron supplementation to preterm babies at two to four weeks. Other babies you need not supplement. You can do it later. Avoid iatrogenic blood losses. And in all this, health education is the key. Teamwork is very important because we have to have the obstetrician cooperating with us regarding some of the interventions, especially the DCC, which seems to have shown definite advantages. My mantra is delay the tramping of the cord by just one minute. I call it just a minute or jam. If each one of us becomes a jammer along with our obstetric colleague, I think a lot of neonatal and infant anemia can be prevented. And for a country like developing country like ours to tackle the problem of anemia, DCC is the most important. Let me say there is no proper guidance still about screening for anemia in infants, newborns for that matter, even in slightly older children. Because when you mean screening, it is population screening and there is a lot of logistics involved in that. I don't know whether Tamil Nadu has introduced it because you are a step ahead. Your neonatal mortality is at the threshold of uh, single digit, probably you are, I would say, congratulate you all because you are ahead by a decade. Though the target is end of the current decade, 2030, you are there, almost there. So congratulations. And with these few points, which I wanted to share with you all, I thank you for your patient listening. I hope I have not uh, uh, overstepped my time of 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ranjan, for a very nice talk and sticking to the time. And you started from antenatal period and the jammer was, I think, a nice word. And leading into the lab or taking the blood from the newborn, you stress a lot. I think that is a very important issue because without realizing, we'll keep on removing blood and doing investigation. I don't find I will just see whether any questions are there. Then there are when to start erythropoietin in preterm baby. In, 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 in very preterm babies, you have to start erythropoietin very early. In the first one or two weeks of life itself, um, it's given twice a week for about, uh, uh, you know, uh, six to eight weeks or a little bit more than that. And that is the one which will prevent uh, 
transfusions needed for the baby or reduce the number of transfusions needed. In my current practice, I realize that nowadays the top-up transfusions required have become lesser and lesser, probably one minimum or two maximum, even for a 28-weeker uh, baby. This has been my uh, observations. Maybe before we were a little bit rash in taking the bloods, uh, our blood gas investigations were a bit more than required, but now we have, and the other thing which you have to uh, now realize is the transcutaneous monitoring has improved. The same instruments which used to lead to burning of the skin, they all have been now refined and they are not having as much, uh, you know, physical damage as we had earlier on. So some of the non-invasive uh, investigations we may have to uh, utilize in order to reduce the uh, number of, I mean, amount of blood taken. But conscientiously recording it and every day seeing how can we reduce rem uh, the frequency of bloodletting will definitely help, I feel. Erythropoietin, as I said, you have to start early and continue for several weeks and only then you can reap the benefit if the baby would have required three transfusions, it may come down to one. Or the hematocrit and hemoglobin would not reduce to such a nadir because of this erythropoietin. Thank you very much, sir, because shortage of time, we may not take any more questions. We'll uh, go to the next speaker. Next, we have Dr. Thank Sikhar. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So next, we'll go to Dr. Sridhar Kalyan Sundaram. Mm -hmm. The judge is MD from JIPMA, DM from PGA. He will be 